trying to put this all together, and uh, we're talking about a lot of abstract things here, but in the end, it's our patients who matter. And again, uh, trying to put this all together, these are three patients from this week, and we can talk about them later, but we've treated uh, these on my service all this week. So trying to solve this, uh, it is so frustrating because the variables are absolutely amazing. And uh, the real life problems are the neurologic acuity, uh, the mobility of a patient, getting the workup done in a timely fashion. Uh, we touched upon that in some of the case discussions. What resources are available? What does the insurance plan allow? Uh, what do you have? Patient factors. This is an unbelievable thing that we don't think about in large statistics. Or availability and care coordination. So let me just ask you realistic questions. Everybody, everybody here be um, a respondent here, please. What is the most likely scenario of a spine tumor patient presenting to you? A, Monday morning at around 10 a.m. with advance warning in your clinic. Anybody? Sanford? Have you ever seen that? If, then it's just a really nothing. B, show of hands please, Friday night, just before a major family event, and you have a full schedule, and the weekend is planned for. Any takers? Everybody. Voila, point taken. Question two, what does your usual spine tumor patient present with? Do they have pretty straightforward story and no issues, or are there B, a lot of issues? Show of hand, I think, option B. C, what are the most common patient questions? What do you think patients actually want to know most about? This has actually been statistically looked at. What will my function be is the number one. Again, I will credit the authors maybe later. I'm probably going to shortcut my talk a little bit. Uh, B, what will my pain be? P pain is a major factor. And uh, only C is, can this be cured? How long will I live? This is one of the factors. But these are the top three questions that patients ask. Yet we frequently get sidetracked in a lot of other things that don't pertain to them. I love this WWW and RRR. I'm going to quote uh, the great Professor Mandel many times because this is really so important. And again, we should all really think about never to be a WWW, but try to do the RRR thing by being a KK person. But that gets dangerous because when you use that acronym flippantly, it can bat So I'm going to not use that. Um, so what this talk is not about is chemotherapy or radiotherapy. They're superb experts. It's something that's an evolving field. And as you saw from the first talk, almost targeted precision therapy is really what it's all about. So some of the directions that I've seen are the patient sphere is getting more and more important. And we as surgeons really should address that first and foremost. Who is this patient that we're seeing? What does the patient actually want? Uh, and what can the patient tolerate? Those are the three big factors I can always think about. And then it's more in our sphere, what do we actually know about the disease? What can we do and what should we uh, do and how should we do it? And finally, the systems thing, time, place, and circumstances. That's why I addressed with some of those questions before. So these are questions uh, that we should ask to help us with the directions. And this is just one face of millions. These are our patients. They look at us for help. They look at us with expectation. But if you look at this very carefully, there's suspicion in there also. There's fear in there. There's a lot in those patients that we have to somehow try to amalgamate. And medicine is not just a science as much as we pretend that and show case histories that basically firm as a comparison series because they have 12 patients in them. It's an art also. And this is what modern medicine is coming to. This is from the great Charles Fisher. This is a functional plot gram of all patients who have had some effectiveness in terms of days of ambulation after tumor surgery and the dollar expense in terms of the Canadian healthcare system, which collects a lot of data points. So this is the emerging real threat. I'm not talking about expenses, yes. That's one factor. But I'm talking about data gathering that's going to be used to direct our care. This is a really big deal. And again, all of us look at the same thing, but we're also looking at um, various things. And again, I'm not wanting to make this a talk about classification systems. But we need to really try to become more systematic. Scoring systems are there as a checklist uh, and something to try to convey a severity gestalt, like the famous Tomita uh, scares. Those are all available now, and we should use those. But we should not dictate care about those. But we should use this as a communication tool. One of the most frustrating things for me when I look at manuscripts and evaluate them is that we don't understand who the patients, who the target audience actually is. But that is in our literature. That comes from the total joint literature from George Cerny in CORE 2003 about osteomyelitis. Three hosts, normal patients, 
immunocompromised patients and severely diseased patients. This simple trifurcation helps us really understand especially spine tumor patients much better. Actually, it pertains to all sorts of spine care and beyond, but in spine, we have not really used this kind of a nomenclature to try to risk stratify and help our decision making. Try not to read this, but our general surgery colleagues have had the Karnofsky score, a zero to 100 score, that is actually reasonably quantifiable in a lot of ways to try to, again, risk assess patients. So conceptual approaches are factors. There's a patient health, then there's a tumor burden, there's a treatment burden, and then there's the outcome sphere. Those are the three big factors, and they very much resemble the radiation symbol, so that's why I like that. But we have to understand the tumor. And again, so much can be seen not just by the type of tumor. Yes, that matters, obviously. Is it breast or is it a hypernephroma? But by the de-differentiation of the cells, the amount of spontaneous mitotic figures, the de-differentiation. That is probably the most important factor. How de-differentiated, how out of control is this? And what does the host do about this? Is there a collected host response or is the immune system just basically done? Metastatic disease. You've heard it from masters uh, before, but again, these are some of the basic numbers. This is getting more and more common, and in a way, we can expect with every incremental uh, success in terms of um, tumor diseases like breast, thyroid, uh, lung cancer, even prostate, et cetera, the list goes on, spine disease will not become an option, but will become an almost certainty. It's just a matter of time, just as uh, Peter just said. And we need to stage these again, and we need to understand better how to stage spine tumors, because even the famous Bill Enneking struggled mightily in kind of squeezing the benign versus uh, malignant versus locally aggressive diseases into spinal uh, anatomy. It doesn't quite fit, yet it matters. Understanding host responses is probably one of the most single important things, yet I see radiologists rarely comment on what the host has actually done where there's a collected cellular response evident on any of the imaging tests or where the body is just being invaded and is receding and destruction. So this factor alone, <coughs> in terms of reporting uh, imaging studies and understanding the disease and the host versus disease uh, issue is a huge deal. And again, these kind of disasters lead me to yet again conclude one of my favorite themes. The spine is actually an organ. I always say that, and the fellows are tired of hearing that. They all go like, oh, no, yet again. But I'm just surprised that we still don't understand and appreciate the spine as an, its own organ system. It, of course, interacts with multiple other structures, but when you see something like this, this is a spinal organ that is at risk of failure. That's, in fact, in a state of failure. So there's a local effect, there's a systemic effect, and there's, of course, a, a major uh, kind of end game scenario that can happen when the spine fails. Stability is such a huge deal. This is, again, one of those simple things that we should have solved. But whether it's trauma, whether it's infection, whether it's deformity, and certainly whether it's oncologic, we've really not done that that well. And again, there have been many attempts at trying to understand the various checklist factors, such as seen here, yet again by Tomita mainly, in terms of what is at risk of falling apart. Ultimately, what matters always for me is the patient, of course. And what matters just like in trauma is, can this patient get up and around and move around in reasonable comfort or not? And if it's oh not, the big question is, are they comfortable when they're laying down? And if they get up, are they in pain or not? So these are, again, some of the main factors. For me, the biggest breakthrough has been the SIN score. Again, these are some of the many authors. This was an AO. Um, event, and again, this has been really becoming more and more popular. Now, why am I pointing this out? I mentioned that earlier. We had a kind of a crisis meeting with some of our oncologists, because there was a question yet again of who owns the patients? Who quarterbacks the patients? And I'd love to have that discussed later in our small group uh, case discussions. Who actually owns these patients? Is it the oncologists? Is it certainly probably not the radiation oncologists, although they know so much? and have such a great expertise. Is it us? Should we be the right people? Or is it internists? I'm not sure. Uh, but somebody has to own these patients. But when we sat down and talked about things that make us tick, we talked about neurology. Then when we talked about SIN scores, there were completely blank faces on the faces of literally every single oncologist. They'd never even heard of this. Yet this has been around in our world for about five to eight years now. This is a big factor. 
So these are relatively, and I'm not going to lecture on that number, but these are relatively reproducible factors. The CAPR score tests have all been done. This does help us in our decision making. And again, we have a zero to six stable point scale. 13 to 18 is clearly unstable. And again, this is our former fellow, Josh Pat, who's uh, kind of put this together very nicely. And it helps, again, communication. That's the whole idea. This does not dictate care. Hopefully, that would be crazy. But it gives us a gestalt of what we're actually dealing with. Junctional regions are problems. This is still something that's completely missed in the discussion of, is this a lymphoma that we can radiate or not? If you have a junctional lesion, it's probably not going to survive even the best, most cunningly designed state-of-the-art radiation therapy. It's probably going to fall apart. So prediction of stability is a really big deal. Mid-thoracic and lower sacrum are probably way more immune towards stability criteria. And again, I cannot overemphasize, and there's a point for that. Does mobility hurt the patient or not? If the patient can't mobilize, that should be somehow scored. Obviously, the cell type uh, matters greatly. Is it blastic versus lytic? That's still something that is frequently not discussed. The system, the SIN score, mandates that we just check on that and think about it. This is probably the best thing. So those are some of the factors I'm just going to run through in the interest of time. But the other thing to think about is patients change. Scores change. If we have collected our assessment in one point scale with our nice checklist that's transparently visible for everybody else, the patient such as this patient over time may change and things can expand, destroy, uh, things may vary. So we have a point scale that kind of communicates relatively objectively with uh, some but not that much inter-observer reliability uh, issues, what goes on. So the big issue is obviously in the majority of patients, we're not talking about primary tumors here, what do we do with metastatic disease, what do we do with spinal cord compression, and what's the prognosis? And let me just say something about prognosis. This is for me one of the biggest issues. We have all been taught about the three-month mark, yet what we now know is the three-month mark very heavily depends upon what kind of pain medication requirements patients have and how functional they are. If they have a reasonably low pain medication consumption, I'm not saying they should be off opiates, but if it's a manageable pain situation, they can actually do surprising things, and I think all of us have seen that. Yet if they're doped out of their minds, their end is near. So prognosis is notoriously unreliable. And again, one of the things where we and our oncology colleagues really have very different expectations. So the mandate that we have is obviously always the Hippocratic Oath, first and foremost, do not harm. And any surgery has a potential for harm. In fact, is a controlled delivery of harm. But the intended benefit is preserve or restore neurologic function, maintain spinal stability, pain relief. And again, the scoring and staging does help us collect our thoughts, communicate clearly, and make it together. Helps us understand as we go through this test, is this an aggressive lesion? Like this bone scan is fantastic. This is all necrosis in here. This is a super aggressive tumor that's killing itself. It's so aggressive and devouring its surrounding tissue planes. Um, this is obviously going to be a real problem. Um, again, we all know the risk stratification in terms of radiosensitivity and, again, chemotherapeutic agents. We should always think about hormones, biphosphonates, and cell-based immunotherapies. What's the problem here? Frequently, pathology nowadays takes weeks, sometimes even months, to come back. I think all of us have seen that. The more our pathologists are getting really good at genetic decoding, the longer it takes to get some form of a meaningful uh, back, uh, uh, idea back of what to do. So as we're looking at all these various factors, the weapons that we have are multiplying, and we have to use them wisely, and somebody needs to put them together. And finding the right balance is so important because none of us want this. This is one of those absolute disasters. I actually took care of this patient at Harborview, and this, again, is a post-radiation complete nightmare. And we had to do massive surgeries to repair this poor patient's back. He actually survived a good bit of while. So the radiation issue is a big deal because I don't know the answer yet. The basic numbers are, all of us know that if you do radiation before surgery, the infection rate skyrockets. If you do radiation after surgery, it's still elevated, but if you wait at least three to six weeks, you have a better chance. And chemotherapy has very similar numbers in terms of healing potential, even with wounds. So pain, function, and survival are the three big currencies for which we still 
um, don't have a consistent reporting structure, one that is basically on the top of every electronic medical record. And that's one of my dreams come true. So I'm going to just skip through this. But basically, if you look at the level of evidence in terms of what all has been done, in terms of studies, there's actually mainly level three studies, for metastatic lesions at least. And conventional radiotherapy and stereotactic radiosurgery, they've actually had much better results reporting, but the case series are usually pretty small. Augmentation has been around now for 30 years. It does show significant improved function. And again, methodologically, the studies all have significant weaknesses in terms of tumor care. In surgery, this is actually one of the most controversial things. We actually have really good data now. The old data was terrible. Laminectomies clearly did not work very well. The treatment paradigm has really been changed by the Patchell studies, and all of us know that. But now we have actually really good data gathering through AO spine. And again, many of our colleagues deserve a lot of uh, um, credit for having looked at this, but it's the surgeon's eyes, it's our eyes. But we now know that <clears throat> ability to walk is a very par paramount for patients, and again, that is clearly improved with surgery if you put it together in an intelligently staged fashion with radiotherapy. So this is from Charles Fisher's uh, group from Canada again, from Vancouver. But basically, uh, they have come up with these newer kind of risk stratifications and treatment stratifications, which do use an intelligently incorporated combination of either radiotherapy alone or surgery and radiotherapy. And these are basically the results of their reporting and surgery and radiotherapy does do l deliver better results. So if we put these things all together, what am I left leaving you with? I think as I'm putting my mind together, I'm really reminded of this great book. I don't know whether you've read it. James Suretsky, The Wisdom of Crowds. Obviously, crowds have a limited value in terms of what to do with cancer patients. But the word teamwork should be something that is on the top front of any form of cancer or a, a tumor interactions with patients. A tumor board is helpful, but they usually gather on a weekly basis. And as we've all concluded that the usual presentation is on Friday nights, and patients have issues and neurology that is of limited value, more post-talk value, more team building. Palliative care should be a very common, uh, commonly used consult, especially in more desperate situations, should be an absolute must. Taking the time to do family conferences is a really big deal. Just yesterday, we had three family care conferences, right, Tanya, in the morning before our indications conference, and they all had very, very significant issues. It takes time. But it shows me a lot if a patient's family is involved at 6 a.m., willing to come in to have a complex conference. And the informal close in the networking, being able to shoot something uh, on email uh, to Hootie about a case or uh, any of the great colleagues that we have is a really big deal. And it's very, very helpful to have other thoughts. I find that very important and not just an internet-based uh, picture. So quality communications is my take home message number one, and apply principles. I think we should, as we all have EMRs nowadays, use scoring systems. They're not mantra, but they're helpful. Why not? And systematic paradigms for what imaging tests, what lab tests do we really need? Who routinely gets nutrition labs in their tumor patients? Dr. Mandel, do you do that routinely? We should, right? We should all, but we don't routinely think about that. We should collect our thoughts, pause, then plan and communicate. Those are the principles that I find very important. And again, we should realize that patients are not an imaging test. They are not a robot with predictable responses. They're human beings, and they all have stories that complicate things so much that the scientific analysis, while so necessary, is limited. Thank you.